We'll call the meeting to order. Um, first item on the agenda is the agenda. Motion to approve the agenda. Is there um, a second that? A second. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Commissioner Sears, um, do you approve the agenda? <laughs> yes. Yes. Aye. <laughs> All right. A motion to approve the agenda passes. Um, second item on the agenda, I'm really not used to this format here, um, is um, public forum. I don't see anyone in this audience. Um, Rob, is there anyone online? We do have uh, Sharon Busher online who's up in queue. Okay. Councillor Busher? Yes, yes. Hi. hi. Good, Good evening. evening. Um, so I am representing myself, and then I'm going to wear multiple hats and represent my neighbors. I'll start with my neighbors, um, and I'm included in that. So I live on East Avenue, and as you know, we had sidewalk repair done, and um, First of all, Chapin knows that the team from Ireland that did the sidewalk worked really well with the residents and did a great job. Um, as far as I have to report that there's some pitting in the concrete, which just had, I just noticed. So I'm a little concerned about that. So um, I'm just letting you all know, and I'll, I'll talk to Chapin or I'll text, uh, email Chapin further with that. But what the neighbors and I were concerned about was the crew that came in, a different crew came in to do the cleanup and raking and picking up the concrete. They really did a lousy job. They are part of Ireland also, but a different team. They left concrete, they raked concrete into the tree belt and into people's yards and stones. Then they spray with this, um, with this seed, um, with this paper shredded, the, it's blue, so it's shredded paper, as I was told, compostable with, with grass seed in it. But what's happened, it is like, it itself is like concrete. You can't go over it with a lawnmower, you can't rake. They did it, they, they did a terrible job and I think it really needs, someone needs to look at it and address it. I'm speaking for Todd Spellman, Josie Bove, Matthew Bertrand and myself, and I didn't have time to go up and down the street, but I know there are others that are unhappy too, but I didn't get their permission to add their names. Um, so I wanted you all as a commission to know this. I'm just making you aware. I don't expect the commission to do anything, but I expect the department to address it with, with Ireland. Um, so now I'm gonna switch to Sharon Busher's issue. Okay, I'm in my mid 70s and um, I knew that the sidewalk had some problems. I had identified some of those problems. So the new sidewalk that was put in is a little, is higher than the original sidewalk. They had to take a piece of my walkway out in order to accommodate the sidewalk work. They had to do that like 30 years ago when they put in the old sidewalk. So there was nothing new about that. But the replacement piece is sloped and slanted. It is a challenge. So it's ironic that the new, that the new sidewalk was created to deal with pooling and unevenness so that people wouldn't fall and slip. And yet what you've created for me, a person in my 70s, is that same scenario. And I am one dissatisfied resident. If I was a person of means, I would address this myself, but I'm in my mid seventies and I'm still working because I need the added income. And I'm really concerned that this is not, I'm not being heard. And I don't feel that, I don't feel that anyone has really seriously looked at this. Chapin knows about it. The director knows about it, but it is unsatisfactory and somebody needs to address this. So I know I've gone more than three minutes, but I feel like this is a serious issue and you're leaving an older resident um, in a situation that is going to create 
her and visitors uh, the potential to fall and slip. Thank you so much. Anyone else online for comments? That's all for public comment. Okay. Um, we'll close public comments. Um, next item on the agenda is the cons consent agenda. Motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Second. Um, motion to approve and um, seconded. Um, all in. Oh, discussion. Oh, right. Oh, thank you. Any discussion around that motion? I had two, two things. Two just things. Two brief things. Uh, one was uh, the uh, Blodgett Street item on the consent agenda had two different addresses listed on that. There was an 80 Blodgett and a 90 Blodgett. Just wanted to clarify that 80 Blodgett was going to be the one getting the ADA parking space. Oh, an 80 Blodgett. Yep. And I think in the draft ordinance it said 90. Do we have a clarification? I'm pulling it up now. Um, I believe it is 80 Blodgett. I will yeah, the, when I looked on Google Street, it all matched 80, but the yeah. draft language just had 90, so I just wanted to point that out. We can make sure to update that. Okay. Because oh. this one says 80. Yeah, yep. and then it, in the like draft language, it says 90. I and, see like, where you're saying that. Yeah. Okay. We can make sure that's updated. And then the other thing I just wanted to mention was the for the Elmwood Ave motorcycle parking. I've, I'm glad this is part of the consent agenda. I've, I've seen, uh, I don't know if it's this particular resident, but a resident at the, uh, the house that I, I believe provided public comment. And I've seen a lot of uh, confrontation between that house and members of the public trying to park there. So hopefully this, this works as a solution um, for that particular address. Okay, so um, staff will clarify um, and make the change to the ordinance language to reflect the accurate address of 80 Blodgett Street. Um, so with that change, um, all in favor of approving the consent agenda, say aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> nope. Okay, um, that passes and on to item number five, um, DPW performance metrics of traffic safety. Thank you, Commissioner O'Neill Vivanco. I'll kick this off and then hand it over to staff. Um, heard loud and clear from the commission that uh, when we looked over our goals and objectives for uh, FY24, that there was a lot of interest to dig uh, into the metrics uh, that guide the department's work. And uh, I was thrilled to hear that and excited to have tonight be our first night of uh, bringing some metrics forward. Um, I think tonight is a bit of a light night and hopefully in future meetings, we'll have even more to chew on. Uh, we've had uh, some staff transition in our transportation planning team, unfortunately. so. Uh, thanks to tech services team stepping up with uh, Julia Orsaki uh, tonight. I'm really pleased that uh, we'll be able to still present to you tonight on uh, traffic safety, which I think we all take near and dear to our hearts. The commission has the authority to do uh, a fair bit through regulation uh, with city ordinance. And so we need to, as leaders, figure out how best to put our thumbs on the scale to enhance safety in our city. And so I'm excited to get this information out tonight. It is just uh, baseline information. We're not coming with any policy recommendations tonight, but thought it would be helpful to at least set the table uh, for baseline data to inform subsequent conversations. And with that, I'll turn it over to Julia. Great, thanks Chapin. Uh, my name's Julia Ursaki. I think I am acquainted with most of you except maybe Commissioner uh, Sears, so hello. I'm a public works engineer here at DPW. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, so we are here tonight to talk, to kind of unveil our crash data dashboard. Um, which is basically um, 
a conglomeration of all of the state crash data for Burlington that we've made publicly accessible on our website. Um, and this is, as Chapin said, just kind of the baseline data that we're going to use moving forward to evaluate how um, different things that we're doing in public works are working. Um, so this is our kind of overview of what this tool is. Um, so the presentation tonight, we'll talk about the tool itself and what it is and the different features of it. We'll talk about um, the data sources and where it came from and also the limitations of it and what we're trying to do to make it better. Um, and then we have a couple different um, trends to look at, at throughout the city over time and also um, taking a closer look at the more vulnerable users of our roads, bicycles and pedestrians. Uh, we have one kind of case study in this presentation about North Ave and then we can talk about the next steps and kind of policy um, things that are coming up in the future. So the dashboard, here it is. This is just a screenshot of it, but it's a website that you can access through the DPW transportation, um, you know, city website. Um, this is the 10,000 foot view of um, crashes in Burlington. Um, the map itself, when you're you know, in, it, in the browser, you can kind of zoom in and out and, and check out different areas. Uh, it's symbolized based on the crash severity, so it certainly looks a bit, um, you know, muddled from here, but I'm going to go ahead and open it in the browser so we can look at um, how the zooming works. So here it is overall, and as you zoom in and out on different streets, the data that you're looking at in the charts will kind of auto-adjust. So if you're, you know, just zooming into one block of, of Union, you can kind of see when different crashes happen. You can hover over, hover over the bars to see the exact numbers. Um, and this is a super useful way to look at the data that we have available through the state, but not as kind of user friendly. Um, up in the top right, you have options to pick the years and if it's is involving a bicycle, pedestrian, or vehicles, um, and then if you're looking at fatalities, injuries, or just property damage only crashes. And um, you kind of saw this a little bit before, but the different graphs in the website show you kind of just some key information about what we're looking at with our crashes, which is mainly the severity, who is involved, and um, there's also a whole chart about what kind of intersection the crash was at, so it's very interesting to see that um, many crashes are not at intersections versus signalized and stop, and we also have RFB crashes up here. So for kind of the back end of all of the different data sources, which is the main part that I helped work on, um, when a crash happens, um, typically people will call and report. If it is not severe at all um, and no one reports it, then we really have no way of knowing about it, which is too bad. Um, then the next branch is that um, if there is an injury or if it's um, serious, um, BPD will send an officer, they'll assign an officer to the incident. And um, this changed in 2020, but um, before 2020, they, BPD pretty much responded to all crashes, no matter the severity, every call they got. Um, but since 2020, they've only been responding to, to ones that are either more serious, involving like more serious property damage or um, any kind of injury or fatality. So there is a bit of a skew in our data right now um, because since 2020, BPD has been assigning officers to actually fewer crashes and um, then if an officer is not assigned to the crash, they don't create a crash report and then it doesn't get reported to the state. Um, so we're working with BPD to get an MOU together to actually get access to those crashes that are called in but don't have an officer assigned to. Um, so that's 
kind of the next step for our crash data and, and using this in a more um, holistic way and accurate way. Um, so with all that in mind, um, there definitely are still some big picture trends that we can look at. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me connect to the VPN super quick. And so while, while Julie is doing that, I think from the data integrity standpoint, the piece that um, we feel very comfortable about are the more severe crashes uh, and uh, whether those be fatalities or crashes with injuries where we have less uh, comfort with the data is the more minor uh, crashes not resulting in injuries. So you'll see that uh, moving forward and uh, uh, we will work on that MOU and get that signed so that uh, all levels of crashes can have a year-over-year -year comparison. Yes, thank you, Chapin. Um, so this chart has pulled out just the fatal injury and serious injury crashes um, since 2010. So um, this will include any of those category crashes. The property damage only are the ones that we're not s super confident about having them all reported. Um, so even with that, um, we have some interesting patterns here, definitely an interesting peak around 2012, and um, I would imagine a decline in 2020 just from fewer people being on the road with COVID happening. Um, and then 2023 is incomplete. Um, but it's really nice to be able to get this kind of quick big picture look at trends over the years in the city, um, and we can kind of with this data more available to us, we can kind of look and try to pinpoint, you know, what projects happen in certain years, what's happening on specific streets, and um, see what is actually making a difference in crashes on our streets. Um, so this is a little bit of a snapshot in uh, number form instead of chart form, but. Um, this, so the all crashes line, looking at 2011 compared to 2019, there even was a reduction, you know, before the potential, you know, fewer crashes being reported in 2020. Um, so that we thought that was an interesting data point. Um, it's nice to see a reduction in injuries between 2011 and 2019, but um, crashes are up in Burlington from 2019 to 2020, which is definitely concerning injury crashes. Um, now we're gonna take a closer look specifically at um, bicycles and pedestrians. So um, we can ignore 2023 because it's not complete data. This is since uh, we pulled the data, which was maybe in May or June. Um, but it is heartening to see that our bicycle and pedestrian crashes have been going down over time. This is kind of opposite the national trend, which is showing more pedestrian crashes um, over the same time period. So I think that's that's a really heartening sign, and um, we can hopefully take a closer look and pinpoint, you know, what have we actually been doing that may have influenced these crashes going down. Um, so similar data in in chart form, but. Um, Despite overall injuries increasing from 2019 to 2022, um, bicycle and pedestrian um, went down, which is a very good thing. So as a little kind of snippet of a case study, an example of how this data can be used, um, I'm, you probably are all familiar with the road diet that happened on North Ave in 2016. It went from a four lane road, two lanes in each direction, to three lanes. Um, so one lane in each direction, a center left turn lane, and bike lanes on both sides. Um, and a big, a big purpose and driver of this change was the safety impacts um, of changing the road configuration for, for a, more safe, um, a more safe layout. And, you know, I think often 
when we're doing those initial studies, we're, we're pulling the data and we're taking a close look and we don't always get the follow-up of, you know, how did it actually work? Um, so I think this tool will be really helpful for doing post-evaluation for all kinds of projects like this. Um, so there has been a decrease, especially in injury crashes. Um, I think the, we, we have to take the 2017 to 2022 data with a grain of salt, knowing less property damage crashes have been reported, but um, it's really heartening to see fewer injury crashes. Sadly, there was a fatality on North Ave um, of a pedestrian. Um, this happened obviously after the road diet was installed, but it was um, not at a crosswalk, or it was at an intersection that didn't have a crosswalk at the time that now has a crosswalk in RFB. So we do hope we've been able to help alleviate that scenario. Um, but even with that, that one fatality story, it's not necessarily the whole picture of how you know, safety has changed along the corridor. Um, so I think overall, we'd be, we're pretty happy to see the reduction in injury crashes and, um, you know, even thinking about some of those missing crashes from 2020 to 2022, uh, a drop in total crashes too. So this is kind of the unveiling of the, the crash data dashboard, which is, like I said, publicly available on our website for, you know, folks to look at and, um, you know, reach out to us with any, any questions and concerns. Um, what we kind of built this for and what we hope to do with this data is feed it into this Vision Zero plan that um, Burlington is doing with the CCRPC to look at the entire city and kind of create more of a policy for our Vision Zero of zero fatalities and serious injury crashes in Burlington. Um, so it, it is kind of just the first step of gathering all the data and making it available, but um, we think it'll be really useful in, uh, you know, a useful tool in making our streets safer. So, Chapin, I don't know if you have anything else to add or if anybody has any questions or... Welcome questions. Yeah. All right, um, commissioners. Mr. Hogan, you want to take a start? Sure. Thank you so much for putting this. I'm excited to see this come together. Uh, I guess one, one question on the, um, the ML, MOU with the, the police department. Do you expect to be able to get back historical data? Yeah, so we have access place? to their full database. Yeah. It's not just from like signing it moving forward. Right. Yep. Very good. Thanks. Also, do you, um, been a few months since I looked at it, but uh, last I checked from the, the public VTRAN site didn't have uh, crash severity in there. Um, it was just like injury or not, yep. basically. Is that something that you're, that is now in the VTRANS data or that you get through some non-public version of that? We request it directly from VTRANS. They have it, but it's for whatever reason not on that tool, which is another big reason that we decided to build our own instead of, I guess, just, you know, always using that one. Yeah. Um, so they have property damage only, injury, or fatal, but they don't have the serious injury category, which we're also really interested in, because um, injuries can be anything from, like, a cut or whiplash to, you know, like an incapacitating injury, which, you know, there is a bit of a difference of, so we want to kind of fine-tune that so yeah okay and because that sounds like a one-off request from vtrans so do you have a like process in place to keep that updated we do so our plan is that every like january we're going to have to pull all of the um previous years Sorry. oh that's okay <laughs> did i hit something um we're going to have to pull all of the crashes from the previous year and then also get the serious injury data from them. So we can do it just in one, in one swoop, and um, they just give us the data in Excel format. It's pretty straightforward to, mm -hmm. to get it from them. But that's a year lag, right? To get the full complete year yeah. prior, yeah. yeah. 
Okay. I think we, we could consider like six months or even uh, like quarterly pulling it. Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, it's, I'll just offer it. Um, then, of course, we can get more recent data, but with like through yesterday or whatever, from right. straight from VTrans, but without the the serious um, the injury classification in there. Right. So maybe the bigger pre point is to keep pressing on VTrans to so just Put it make in. that information available in their thing that you guys could be just grabbing. Yeah, that's true, and I'm not sure why they don't. I've not actually asked. Uh, okay. Billy, do you want to stop sharing so the folks online can see? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Did um, you get any support from the like the city data analysts team in, in this, or was it just a public works effort? This was a, primarily a public works effort, though we have talked about. Um, collaborating with them, at least to make the data available to download from yeah. the city's OpenGIS um, website. But this was a DPW effort. Sure. Yeah. OK. Hey, well, it's, it's a great start. Um, I guess some minor like comments on aesthetics and things that I might um, provide offline. Yeah. And I got into a, a weird situation clicking around bars to subset things yeah where the range on the axis on the vertical axis jumped and was no longer pinned to zero huh so it was showing me a range from like 31 to 32 based on what i clicked I don't know, I'll, I'll send you that screenshot There's yeah that maybe would a couple be little quirks that looking at this obviously like having larger print on the numbers yes, and things totally that, it's definitely um, meant to be more of an interactive thing than a screenshotted thing in a presentation yeah. so well, for sure i appreciate you taking uh, the time to look through okay uh and obviously uh, yeah this, this is as uh director spencer said um setting the table for more interesting analyses to come we'll look forward to that I, the obvious question jumped to mind uh about where uh if there are places that are still like bucking the trend and stubbornly high uh, risk for people on foot and on bike. Yeah, and I think that's Where like the real success stories where it's really dropped. Yep. Um, and we want to do that kind of corridor level look in our Vision Zero plan when we have yeah. some more consultant support in a Great. more. Another thing to keep in mind, I don't, uh, to my knowledge, I don't think we have, I don't know, readily available data to tell us how many people are biking or walking but anecdotally it seems like it's increased over the past 12 years th that this range is here and that could be a good story as well if you're speaking in terms of like the risk rate for things because even if there's the same number of crashes but tons more people mm -hmm. on foot or on bike then th that crash rate has, has gone down yeah the per capita yeah. there's a lot of potential uh, good stuff in here i like it thank yeah. you Appreciate Commissioner Hogan your comment about data and I just would share that one of the things I'm really excited to bring forward to you is that we're using new detection software and cameras at intersections that's that are actually able to automatically count uh, vehicles, bikes and peds and disaggregate them. So we're going to be able to show approaches and volumes of all different modes of traffic, which is something we never could have afforded to do before. So we'll we'll, we'll bring that at a subsequent meeting. Commissioner Fox. Thanks for the presentation, Julia. It's awesome. There are a lot of data nerds, I think, in this room. So, um, but I can only speak for myself when I say, yeah, it was great to sort of poke around in it. And the only comment I had ec definitely echoes uh, Chair Hogan was like, whenever I look at crash data, I always want to know, okay, like what is the context of that? Mm -hmm. You know. Um, you know, how did the crash numbers compare to the overall number of users, especially when we're talking about vulnerable users, mm -hmm. right? So just like pulling an example, there were 869 bike ped crashes in 2022, right? Out of how many vulnerable roadway users? Was it 1,000? Because that's a really bad benchmark. Or right. was it 10,000, right? right? Like that, that relativity and that context, I feel like is 
um, super important. So it's really good to hear that those count systems, the cameras are being implemented. Um, so yeah, that was like, Chair Hogan kind of stole my thunder. That was my only sort of question, comment type thing was just like that context. So yeah, it's great. Um, that's all I had. Let's clarify, it's uh, for former chair. Oh, oh sorry. sorry, Commissioner Hogan. No, no disrespect to our Hogan. current chair. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Chair O'Neill for Blanco. No, don't worry, I can still think of it as chair. Probably this guy in the end. <laughs> um, Commissioner Barr. Thanks, I mean, both Chair Hogan and Chair hey. Fox stole my thunder too, so <laughs> we should start with me next time. No, I'm just kidding. I, I, I really appreciate the, the presentation and especially the crash, uh, the, the camera that, that measures all that. I think that's going to be a huge boon, but that's really a lot. Commissioner Barr, I'm the chair now. <laughs> Does that mean you're going to start with me? Maybe. Um, Commissioner De uh, Vice Chair Damiani. <laughs> I had one clarifying question first is the under the crash type category where it's vehicle bike and pedestrian is that so if like under the pedestrian category is that that's just car sort of to pedestrian is that how I'd interpret that or like so that is one thing in the state database if it was involving a pedestrian at all it's um, just pedestrian it goes to pedestrian okay right um, yeah I think like other commissioners said I think they're there's a lot of great stuff in here, and I think once we have some of that other data, overlaying that with um, particularly the construction portal that DPW has with all the completed projects and sort of meshing all those together, I think that would be um, really great to see so folks can sort of make their own conclusions with all the great data that DPW has um, or for some of the stuff that you were talking about. Um, and then lastly, for the, the Vision Zero plan, could you just elaborate a little bit more what that project is with DPW and CCRPC? I can, and um, once we kick it off with our consultant, I'm sure we'll be back to, to get you guys involved. Um, but this project is, it's, it's, it's evolved a little bit, and um, it's been around as a CCRPC project actually since before I started, but it's intended to be kind of an update to our Plan B TV walk bike in the context of safety. So kind of reprioritizing some of the projects that haven't been done yet based on um, where the need is most and also identifying um, safety issues throughout the city that were not addressed in the walk bike plan. Um, so I assume it'll be a very data-driven process and we certainly hope to integrate all of the things we've been talking about in terms of you know, looking at volumes versus crashes and roadway type and um, also even looking at like what kind of facility the you know are bike crashes occurring on streets with bike lanes or you know sharrows or no bike facility um, so to kind of like you know dig much deeper into the details of where our crashes are happening and why and and then what we can do especially for the more vulnerable road users excellent thank you commissioner sears any comments Um, I just got the link to look, so I hadn't, I haven't really looked at the tool in too much detail, but um, it seems like really rich data. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, no, I, th I think it's great. And, um, and you're absolutely right that nationally the trend is absolutely astounding and the increase in um, a decrease in BMT and an increase in and pedestrian does. so I think it's really remarkable that we're bucking that trend so kudos to Burlington but I'll spend some more time with the tool no. that sounds good and we are absolutely open to the kind of like symbology and you know feedback that uh, Commissioner Hogan was referencing um, <clears throat> Julia, thank you. Um, thank you for this. Um, I really like this idea of um, drilling down to see how this can support in, in the pre and post assessment of any of our infrastructure changes. Mm -hmm. um, 
I'd also like to see, um, as Commissioner Fox mentioned, and Chair but Brendan <laughs> Hogan, Chair, I can't call you anything but Chair Hogan, um, commented on the layers of, um, of users. Because I think looking at, well, VMT is down, but as vehicle miles traveled is down, does that mean then that there are more bike pads? So mm -hmm. recognizing that, you know, data is all, I'm, I'm a qualitative person, just for the record. So data can be imperfect. Um, and if we're missing pieces of it, let's figure out what are the pieces that we need to, um, mm -hmm. to add to have a more complete picture. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess another one minor, I guess, point is how, how to define injury. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just see this injury selection, and you mentioned like it could be a cut or you, know, you broke your leg or lost a limb. Right. Um, that severity, um, how, how is that pinpointed and how do we find that information out? Um, so we can get crash reports um, from the police department um, and they will typically in the narrative mention the um, like what kind of injury it was um, but that's combing through like thousands of okay. reports which is hard which is why we were so happy to be able to get the um, severe injury mm -hmm. category from VTrans which they have to report. It's like a federal requirement. Okay. Um, so that's that's the best we're at right now. We're hoping if we bring um, a consultant on board with some more like crash data expertise, they may have some ideas for diving a little deeper into those. Okay. And um, and when do we hope the MOU um, to be in place with the Burlington Police? I I don't know the timeline on that myself. Um, we are fairly close. I am okay. looking at it. I would hope that within the next month or two that we will have that MOU signed. Okay, great. Awesome. That's all for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and now we'll go to um, public comments. Anyone on the line? We, we don't have, oh, we do have one public comment. Uh, Sharon Busher, you're in queue. Hi, good evening. This was very important and interesting data. Thank you so much, um, DPW Department, for collecting all of this. Um, I, I wanted to ask how, how this was being addressed. We know that um, you, you had two periods of time, one from up to 2015 or something, and then one from 2017 to 2022. And we know that during COVID, people didn't move around as much. And so how, how is that being factored into this all? Um, because the chance for accidents was greatly reduced if you didn't have as much traffic on the roads and opportunities, unfortunately, for mishaps. And so I wasn't quite sure had that be had that been addressed, or how was it addressed, or will it be addressed? I don't know the answer, and I wasn't able to figure it out on my own. So thank you. Wanting to look at these crashes in the context of how many cars are on the road and how many how many people are walking. Um, so that is not in the current tool, but it is something we hope to integrate um, with the work that's happening on the Vision Zero plan. So am I still, can you still hear me? Yep. Okay. My, my biggest concern is that I, I feel like we, we in the city of Burlington um, has done, has taken great strides in trying to make pedestrian and bicycles um, act, uh, movement safer. Uh, we've got a long ways to go, but I'm concerned that we, I don't want to um, make ourselves feel too self-satisfied because I'm not sure that because of this unknown entity that I addressed and you acknowledged, I'm not sure that 
the improvement is as significant as the data suggests right now. And I was concerned about that. Um, I think we've made improvements and I can't believe, I, I believe that those have reduced the incidence of accidents. I truly believe that, but I'm not sure to the power that the data suggests. So that was the rationale for why I was asking this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Councillor Bashor. Any no. other um, online participants for public comment? No, that's all. Sir, which are you here for public comment? No. no? Okay. Um, all right. So there's no action required. Um, we'll go ahead and close this item. Do you need to vote on the close? There's no. Uh, there's no, no action warrants. No action needed, right? No. Okay. No. That is correct. Okay. Um, great. We'll close item number five. Thank you, Julia, for that presentation. Thank you. And we'll go on to item number six, the GMT fare policy. Great. I'll uh, start, kick this off. And we have with us Clayton Clark, who is the uh, general manager of GMT. Thank you so much, Clayton, for taking time this evening. Clayton is uh, definitely proving his uh, his commitment to public transit by uh, getting out every night this week at public meetings, was in Barry City last night, in Burlington tonight. Um, I serve on the uh, GMT uh, board, uh, probably the longest serving member right now, which is a little frightening. Um, and after a unique obviously and uh momentous time during covid uh, we were able through state support to operate fare free for a number of years but uh, i serve on the finance committee of gmt and uh, we are hitting a much more financially constrained period and uh, the realization and the reality i think has uh fully uh, set in with the board and the understanding that the resumption of fares is necessary to continue a robust transit system and the question is then how do we do that in a way that's fair that innovates and provides new services and you know provides a level of customer service that uh, we didn't have previously when we had fares and you know i'm pleased that what staff has put forward is a significant step forward despite it charging fares fares are what unlocks our ability to draw down state and federal dollars and continue uh, GMT's robust transit service. So uh, without any further ado, I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Clayton. And, uh, you know, the board has slowed down the process a little bit, as you're, you'll hear tonight. So there is uh, additional time for your meaningful feedback here as the board considers whether to approve this at, a, at the, its next meeting. Clayton. Thank you so much, Chapin. And uh, I spent uh, a good part of my day to day uh, um, working uh, on a, a process that required me to reference a uh, policy document from 2008 that Chapin signed. And so, uh, to, you know, that, uh, so 15 years ago, uh, you signed a document and it's still uh, 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 being used. And, and uh, so, thank you, Chapin, for your long service. Um, and so what I want to kind of walk through is some of the things that uh, we talked during our public um, uh, meetings where we, we told people about what we were thinking of so that we can get their uh, response. And, um, and as Chapin alluded, uh, there have been a few changes uh, that have happened since then uh, that I'll uh, let you know about um, because this is still very much a, a work in progress. And, uh, but before we get into what's coming, I kind of want to um, talk a little bit more about what has happened. And so um, very briefly, uh, we started offering fare free service in 2020 um, in April uh, because we needed to reduce the contact between uh, drivers and uh, the public because of uh, COVID. And so we wanted to have our riders be able to enter through the back of the bus um, to be physically distant uh, from the from the driver and then so that they would be able to come on board and then find a spot uh, hopefully also uh, distant from others um, we really liked operating the zero fare service we like the fact that it, it's giving to our community without a financial barrier um, 
and uh, and it was an experiment that the state uh, uh, thought was a good investment too. And so between federal funds uh, and then state funds, we were able to continue the service to the present. And uh, we presently have uh, state funds that will uh, cover the revenue loss uh, for fares uh, through January. Um, I can uh, uh, let you know that we are we projected to return to fares in January. It's probably going to be more like March, and the the reason why is because even though the procurement and the rollout is going very well, there's a component to it that is going to be uh, not available to us until the end of January, and uh, and so we're now saying that uh, January is probably not going to be happening and uh, it's likely going to be uh, the uh, the sort of target date that we're setting uh, would be the day after town meeting day so march march 6th um, but because it's still fluid you know we're not uh, you know setting an official start date or, or anything along those lines um, so i also want to talk a little bit about what routes we're uh, we're are returning to fair service and so uh, uh, GMT is, is somewhat special in the world of transit and that there's very few transit agencies across the country that operate both rural uh, uh, public transit and urban. And so this is only going to apply to the urban uh, the network. The rural, uh, uh, the rural network that we operate has uh, different funding uh, mechanisms, uh, different federal rules that we follow. And the state and VTrans uh, has made a commitment to keeping uh, uh, rural transit fare free. One of the reasons why they can do that is that the cost of keeping rural transit fare free statewide is about a $500,000 cost, where keeping uh, urban transit fare free is about a $2 million cost. And so there's a, there's a big difference there. So what we're talking about is our urban local routes. Uh, these are the, the, the one, the two, the, the, the five that you see moving around uh, uh, in the area. We're talking about our uh, commuter routes. So coming in from, uh, from Milton and Jeffersonville uh, and the 116 commuter and our link express routes uh, coming in from St. Albans and Montpelier. And so uh, um, when we came up with uh, the fare policy, um, we, we wanted to do something different than we've done in the past, which was basically um, a cash-based system uh, that people would pay uh, when they would get on board. Um, and they, if they wanted to do something different, they would be able to get a uh, monthly pass. They would have to pay up front for that. Um, or they could get a, say, a, a 10 ride pass that, again, that they would have to pay up front for. And so we wanted to provide uh, more modern features like being able to pay with a credit card right on the bus so that there would be simplicity. We wanted to, we realized that things were sort of complicated with our fare structure because there was a different rate for link routes, a different rate for community, uh, commuter routes, and a different rate for um, urban routes. They all had different monthly pass costs, so it was, you know, not uh, clear. And if you used the link and then the, the public uh, or the local routes, then it just made it even more complicated. So we wanted to simplify things. Um, and, uh, and so what we uh, are moving towards um, is uh, a system that is offered by the company called Genfair. And uh, their system is called Genfair Link. And what it will be able to provide is that people will be able to come on board, uh, they'll be able to use a credit card, they'll be able to use a debit card, they'll be able to pay in cash still, um, they'll be able to pay with their smartphone, and we suspect most people will use a smartphone to pay, um, or they'll be able to use a smart card. And it's actually those smart cards that are the thing that is, is gonna hold us up that are expected for delivery later uh, in January, and you'll hear their importance in, in just a moment. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we really like about uh, the Genfair Link system is it lets us sort of flip the script when it comes to uh, uh, cost containment. So previously we would have a, um, uh, 
that monthly pass, that that was going to be your most cost-effective way uh, to, uh, to use the service. But that required people, as I mentioned, to, to outlay uh, $40. Previously, it was $50 uh, for the monthly pass. What the GenFair Link system is going to allow us to do is the opposite of that, which is set a cap. And so uh, with the fare structure, uh, what will happen is, is that people will use um, whatever way that they pay, whether phone, whether smart card, um, and, uh, and that uh, will I know who they are. So it's no longer sort of a dumb system where somebody pays the $1.50, but we have no idea who that person is. It will know who that person is when they pay, so that when they reach a certain amount of cost, we can say, you know what, the rides after this are going to be free. And so instead of people having to pay up front uh, for a, a pass, uh, they'll, get to a, they'll get to a cap and the, and the rides will be free afterwards. Um, so what we are uh, looking to do is to um, have all of our routes uh, that are returning to fare service uh, go to a standard uh, flat uh, fare rate of two dollars and so previously our urban routes were a dollar fifty our commuter routes were two dollars and our link routes were four dollars and so this will make all of them uh, two dollars and the price cap instead of having separate uh, passes for each of these the price cap will apply to all uh, three of those. Um, we had hoped to be able to have the price cap set at $40, um, which was the previous cost of the monthly pass. Um, we did have, uh, the state legislature did set a revenue goal for us, and so that revenue goal was that we had to come up with 10% uh, of our revenue uh, for urban operations uh, to come from fares. And one, uh, uh, we just last week got some uh, cost projections. We had a consultant do the cost projections for us uh, because this was a very um, uh, more complicated uh, figuring out than, uh, than we could really do with our, with our data internally. And uh, what we found out is that we're going to be under, under that 10% if we go with the $40 cap. Uh, fortunately, we will be right on target with a $50 cap, and so our expectation is uh, that we will probably go with the $50 cap instead of the $40. Um, since we've already done public meetings where we've told people that we're going to try to do this for $40, you know, we're going to do public uh, meetings again, letting them know that, hey, we tried 40 but it's not going to work. Uh, so we'll give people the opportunity to provide uh, input for that. One of the things that I want to uh, 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 mention is that we do have uh, discounted um, uh, rides uh, for people who are 18 and under, people who are 60 and older, and people who self-identify as disabled. Those folks get uh, their rides uh, for 50% off. Um, our uh, belief is from our past data that about half of our riders end up qualifying uh, for that discount, and uh, and so their cap uh, wouldn't be fifty dollars; it would be twenty-five dollars a month, and their cost per ride uh, wouldn't be two dollars; it would be one dollar. Um, the uh, um, let's see, and oh, where I'm sorry, I forgot to mention there will also be a daily cap so that if somebody needs to make uh, multiple trips during the same day, um, that once they get to a certain amount, uh, it will also, uh, their rides after will be free. Um, I think that we're gonna stick with $4 as the daily cap, um, even, even though the cost estimate uh, um, um, uh, shows that that's gonna be tight. And so that means that if somebody you know, needs to take four trips in a day, it's not going to be eight dollars; it'll just be the four dollars. Um, and so that is just a very uh, quick overview of. Um, oh, oh, I forgot the important thing, um, uh, which I wanted to talk about: the smart cards. And so we know that a lot of our, uh, a lot of the, the people that use the bus are, are cash-based riders. 
uh, they don't have the ability or, or choose not to have a credit card or a debit card. And so these folks will be able to have all of the same uh, price protections of the cap by using a smart card. Uh, they'll just come to the transit center, uh, they'll come to GMT headquarters, um, and they'll, we'll issue them a smart card, they'll give us cash, and then we'll put that value on the smart card. Uh, and so uh, it was very important to us from an equity uh, perspective that we, uh, that we stay, um, uh, that have those protections uh, available to our cash-based uh, riders. And one of the things that will make, will be even more convenient is that uh, the GenFair Link system is part of a national retailer system called Incom, and uh, it does take 18 to 24 months for us to become active in Incom, but sometime in 2025, um, what we expect is, is that somebody would be able to take their smart card and go into any CVS, any Walmart, any uh, Walgreens, and hand over their card and twenty dollars and you know have that money you know or whatever dollar amount that they provide and have that added to their smart card so even though right now they'll have to go to the transit center to add uh, funds to uh, to their smart card uh, in the future they'll have greater um, expansion and so um, i'm going to turn it over to you all to uh, uh, to have a discussion instead of just me talking with you uh, but in closing, um, you know, we're sad to see fair free service go, but we think that this is um, definitely better than uh, uh, the fair collection system that we had before and um, is something that uh, I think is going to be, um, you know, really bringing us into a much more modern, uh, you know, public transit. So what's on, on folks' minds? I do want to say that usually when I'm in this room, I'm talking to our friends with the toque. And, uh, um, and Jean always asks me hard questions. And so uh, I expect uh, you all will do the same, and I look forward to that. Thank you for your presentation. Mm -hmm. We'll ask hard questions, but we'll be nice, too. Excellent. <laughs> well, he's nice. <laughs> Sometimes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Let's start with Commissioner Fox. Hi, Clayton. Hello, nice it's so you. good to see you. Mm -hmm. um, thanks for the presentation. I feel like I've heard a lot about, you know, the fair resumption, so it's nice to s just listen to it all laid out in one way, mm -hmm. uh, one place, rather. Um, Um, I had one clarification question, and mm -hmm. so I don't know if I misheard you or what, um, but um, for the discounted passes, mm -hmm. I think you said 18 or younger, but the fair document said 17 or younger, so I'm just wondering if you could clarify what that is. I'm sorry, it's discount. under 18. Under so 18. yes, okay. yes. It I'm, could I, be I that I misheard you. No, I, I'm, I'm sure I misspoke, sure. yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Under 18. Under 18. Got it. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, okay. Commissioner Fox? Yes. Can I just jump in with one mm -hmm. comment there? The, the document has, says under 17. Oh. So Which document are you looking at? I'm looking it's at this like, no. look, like a Word document kind of thing that was attached after the briefing. Uh, ah. Okay. The, uh, love to know between those three what, uh, what we're looking at. Uh, Chapin, I think you told me that you added this was our fair document that we sent around? Draft fair yeah. proposal for public comment. Then uh, mm -hmm. I apologize for that. I think that's a typo. I think it is, uh, as you can clearly hear, I used to mix it up. Uh, so it's uh, 17 and younger or 18 and under? Under 18. It's under, under 18. 18. Yeah. Okay. 17 and six, under 18. Yeah, 6 to 17, you'd pay the discounted fair. Under 6 would be free. Free anyway. Yes. Okay. It would just be easier if we banned children, but <laughs> apparently that's not allowed. Darn. <laughs> Thanks, and sorry for jumping in. Yeah. No, that's Thank okay. You. It's good to mm -hmm. get it out there. Um, okay. And then um, on the smart cards, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if this is just like totally like out there and like down the road, but I guess I'm concerned because they sound 
smart and useful and you'll be able to reload them and stuff. You know, to what extent, um, like, is there a cost per card? Like, are people gonna have to pay if they lose them to be replaced? Like, cause that sounds like a big investment that GMT is making and yes. so just sort of curious about that. So the, of it. so the plans to start is that the uh, the cards themselves are are somewhat expensive. I think mm. they're about four dollars a piece. Okay. Um, uh, and we're going to provide people that four dollar card, and uh, there is and that would be like a credit card. It's a, it's a nice piece of plastic. It's going to have like the GMT uh, you know logo on it and and uh, look, look fancy. And one of the things I do want to make sure that people know is that. Um, uh, we're insisting that uh, there's nothing on the card that would distinguish between a discounted ride and a, and a full price ride because we wanted to make sure that there mm -hmm. would not be obvious to mm -hmm. people getting on the bus. Um, there is also uh, like a, a $1 uh, Tyvek card. <clears throat> and, um, and so our expectation is, is that if we have a, a rider that sort of continuously loses their card, then at some point in time we will start, you know, hey, we're still going to give you the smart card, but it's going to be this cheaper Tyvek card. It probably won't have our logo on it. It will still have the, all of the same functionality. Um, I really want us to avoid having to get into a situation where we're charging for those smart cards. Mm -hmm. So I think that we're going to uh, try to see how it goes and uh, not create a, uh, uh, you know, a payment expectation unless we see that we, that we need to. Okay. And, and for the people that do lose their cards, one of the things that I really like about this is that uh, in the past you paid your $40 for your monthly pass and if you lost that piece of paper because it was just like cardstock, um, your, your $40 is gone. Mm -hmm. um, here, if, you, um, if I lose my card and I show up um, at the transit center and say, hey, I lost my card, then we'll deactivate the other one and reactivate the new one and the person doesn't lose anything. And, um, um, and that's also going to help with some of our organizational work that we're doing so that like when we work with the schools and the Howard Center and the stuff, people aren't going to just be able to, you know, give their card to somebody else. Uh, 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 so we'll make sure that the people getting the, the rides paid for are, are, you know, who they need to be. Okay. okay, and then I had one more, I think it's just a clarification question or, so for the commuter monthly cap, and then the regular monthly cap, are those separate or can you, is it just like <coughs> one 40 or 50 say dollar fare and you can use that for the commuter routes and that same chunk of 40 can be applied then to like the local routes you as well? You can use it throughout our entire system of fares. Okay. And that is a huge improvement from before because the link monthly pass used to be $150. Okay. And people will now be able to use the link for fifty dollars, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, so that part's going to be really helpful. Okay, so they're the same thing. I'm just wondering why they're called out. There's a little chart in our packet that has like a monthly cap that's forty, and then the commuter monthly cap that's also forty. So they're the same thing. I'm just yeah, yes. Sure. Okay. I think that we just wanted to make the so that people can see the comparison right. between what an old uh, monthly uh, pass used to be. That makes sense. Yep. Okay. That's all I have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Fox. Commissioner Sears, you want to go next with any comments? Mm -hmm. um, I don't have any comments. Um, I guess I'm thinking about the card. Is the card transferable? Or it's linked to a, one individual? It's linked to one individual. But... Um, so... You know, I'm, I'm sure that like families will probably share them and, you know, I, we're not going to police that, uh, uh, you know, heavily. Okay. Yeah. And, and we're still going to, one of the things that I know that we have to figure out uh, that we haven't done yet is, all right, what happens if you have a person, you know, uh, a mom or dad who comes on with three kids, uh, you know, how are we going to, how, how are we going to handle <laughs> those? And, and, oh. She is. That was, was a that lucky guess. Too. Was that a lucky guess? Okay. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, I suspect that we are going to, because uh, what we don't want to do is have them run the card three times because right. of the, the fair capping. Mm -hmm. so, so that's something we haven't figured out yet, but we know that we need to uh, address. Um, I can tell you, I'm probably leaning towards, you know, uh, kids traveling with a parent, you know, uh, I would want to support that, but I don't want to say more than that until the board blesses my crazy ideas. Because <laughs> we, I used to have, I used to use the 10 card and we would all just, you know, just swipe it three times. Um, yeah. But yeah, I could see you would, you would max out right away if you did that. Um, one, one of the, uh, this came up to us, uh, uh, I'm sure you're not surprised during the public, uh, the meetings and uh, because uh, we heard from uh, a family member who was like, well, gee, now suddenly for me to take my family, uh, you know, to somewhere in town, it's far cheaper for me to do the car and that's the opposite of what we're trying to promote. So, um, mm -hmm. so yeah. I'm going to myself. Thank you, Commissioner Sears. <laughs> Commissioner Barr. Thank you. And thanks. Another great presentation. And I'm uh, um, really excited about the new systems that you've got coming in. I, I just wanted to, I, I promise I won't harp on the card system because I've traveled to DC many times and they have a Metro card. And yes. I love the idea of a Metro card and being able to, because what, for me at least, Having the Metro card with money on it, mm -hmm. I got to use it. So then I'll, I'll be forced into public transportation yeah. rather than trying to find another way to get around. Yeah. Um, do you see us ever coming to that? I, it sounds like the card is really for maybe the unbanked or those that might not have a smartphone, or are we switching to smartphones now? You know, I think that people are going to find that this, the convenience of the smartphone mm -hmm. is really going to be uh, what they are going to choose mm -hmm. because. Uh, They'll be able to download a GMT branded app that Jen Fair will create for us. Um, and so they'll be able to create their own account um, mm -hmm. and set, uh, and if they've already got like payment set up on their card, I mean, it'd be probably two minutes for them mm -hmm. to, to do this on their own. And then it would be the same sort of, because uh, it's a contact free, you know, when um, you go to pay now that there's the places that have the little Right. dots where you just bring it close by mm -hmm. so they'll just have to bring their phone by it they don't have to have uh like the app specifically open or and uh i think they're going to find that that's mm -hmm. like going to be the um the easiest way and it's also why i'm not too worried about um you know like the cost of the smart cards because mm -hmm. i think that uh, uh, most of our riding population is going to choose not to have them right and it shows how long it's been since i've been to dc they probably are using smartphones now instead of instant cards. <laughs> I'll tell you, mine. you know, the thing that I yeah. love about the DC thing is that they have those, but I also know like when you're a first time user, it's scary. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so, and, and really one of the things that uh, uh, I didn't really touch about in our, uh, my presentation because um, I wanted there to be more discussion um, is that uh, we're building in at least six weeks of um, account creation time uh, so that uh, uh, we'll be able to provide that training to folks because we we know that anxiety about how is this going to work is a real disincentive for people to use it and so we're going to have events not just at the, the transit center but we're going to have events at like the U-Mall and other community locations where it's come on down we'll help you set it up on your phone if you uh, have a phone. If you don't have a phone, we'll get you hooked up with a smart card and we'll tell you this is how it works. So maybe QR codes at all the bus stops? That I'm, I'm sure you will see that. Uh, that would be a yeah. quick way to do it. Yes. Yeah. That's I'm how sure. I use the bike share. So. Yes. Mm -hmm. all right, that's it for me. Thanks. Okay. Put myself on mute. Commissioner Damiani, you have oh. anything to ask about GMT? Oh man, this is scary. I, I told have them to be nice to me today. I have no comment as a GMT employee <laughs> working intimately on this project. <laughs> you dream about this. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Chair Hogan, anything from you? It's not my name. Hogan, sorry. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, better to meet you, Mr. Clayton. Um, and you know, I, I will have to say, there's another Brendan Hogan that I previously worked with, and so when I when I 
I used to work in state government, and when I showed up, I was oh, like, oh, that's a different Brendan Hogan. All right, <laughs> so here we are. Could you clarify, are uh, buses then cash free? They will not be cash free because we we think some people will just you know want to still come and give you two dollars exactly yeah and the um, and you know I think that the reality is is that if you're a non-discounted rider and um, you're an only occasional user you know you may not the incentive to create an account may not be that big a deal uh, because you'll just put in your two bucks you don't even have to find change. You know, and, and actually that was one of the, the factors of why we, you know, went with $2 was not just the dollar amount, but but the change was always an issue. And uh, um, and so they'll be able to do that. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so there still will be cash. I will tell you that it cost us probably double the money uh, of the new fare system by making sure that we could still do cash but we just know that that's a, uh, a equity consideration that we wanted to keep providing that. Yeah, I was just guessing that like, that complicates your fare box setup, but I, I think it makes sense. Yeah. I think the cap makes sense as well, I like the idea of that, rather than sort of having to guess how the month is gonna go in advance, just start paying up until you hit that exactly. monthly um, maximum. I, I like the sound of that. Uh, you know, I agree with the sentiment that the, the fare free would be nice, but I feel it's, and I think research has shown it's more important that the bus service be usable than it be free. Um, and I, I know, well, I guess let, let me ask you this. It, my sense is it seems grossly unfair for our uh, representatives in Montpelier to request that we cover 10% of our urban operating costs mm -hmm. while covering none of our rural operating costs. I can't disagree with you there. Um, could you, do you have um, offhand, you know, that's aside another topic for another meeting, but do you know offhand sort of the general subsidy per rider on the rural system versus the urban system? I don't want to hazard a guess because it will just be a, a, a wag, but I'll be happy to get uh, back to you on that and um, uh, and so just to clarify we're and actually uh, Chris do you mind if I call upon your GMT expertise to answer his question what what data do you think would would do that because we could look at the transit rate but that's going to just cost that'll look at the cost per ride I believe in Steve's analysis that he did for the legislature, I believe that's in that report. I just don't have that in front of me. Okay, thank you for the, for the direct. Yeah. That was the report that came out last year? The report to the legislature, yeah, I believe that's in last there. Yeah. Okay. I'll give that a read, thanks. Uh, you know, is that, I would sort of caution some of the language around that. There was a slide in there, that, and, and you spoke to it, that because pre-pandemic the fares were only 500,000 on the rural routes mm -hmm. that's cost less to cover that amount of fares yeah but it does not cost less mm -hmm. to provide service to those riders I agree um, and I think that's something we should be shouting from the top of the Capitol in Montpelier mm -hmm. um, and I you know it's a, an, we have elected officials that, that don't don't get this. Mm -hmm. And we need to help them get this. I, I can tell you that definitely there was uh, uh, like Senator uh, Chittenden, uh, former GMT uh, chair, you know, he definitely, you know, brought up this concern and, and was, uh, was speaking pretty uh, loudly of the perceived uh, inequity. Um, I can tell you that uh, one of the things that uh, you know, going into the legislative session, I thought that there was a good chance that the legislature would extend zero fare. And so the cynic of me says mm -hmm. that we're going to uh, get our fare service up and running perfectly just at the time that the legislature decides that we really should be fare free, you know, across the state, uh, you know. But uh, that's, that's the, the cynic of me because what I'll notice is that the House Transportation um, 
there's a good contingency of folks there that think that fare free should be you know the way of the future for 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 all of Vermont. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that there's uh, it's not. I, I don't see this as a settled issue, you know, going into future legislative sessions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. And I, I think we should also be honest that um, fare free, you know, would be nice, but it's that's not getting people out of private vehicles, right? I think research has shown that largely replaces trips that are not in vehicles in yeah. the first place. Yeah. I'm frugal. I'm not going to pay if I don't need to, but if I'm walking somewhere and there's a bus coming and it's free, I'll hop on. Yes. If there's a bus coming and I'm like, I'm not freezing to death, so, you know, if it's two bucks, I'll, I'll save my two bucks maybe. Um, we, we definitely know that we're going to lose ridership and that those people are going to be making exactly those calculations. Mm -hmm. uh, that I used it before because it costs nothing. Now I'm going to think about it. Yeah, but we've got to like make it an awesome service. Yes. And I think that, um, you know, I arrived, uh, I started in January, and, um, and so the board was just sort of wrapping up some of the discussions about their budget and about whether, whether there would be the need to return to fares. And uh, one of the things that, uh, uh, that I noticed was that there was, the board was essentially selecting the preservation of uh, service uh, over fare free like we could continue to operate fare free but we would have to give up service and the thinking was that uh, then that goes against you know climate goals that goes against all you know sorts of uh, of other you know uh, issues that were uh, are important to us yeah. and uh, and so that was why you know this path was was chosen yeah, yeah I totally agree yeah I'll, I'll also say one of the things that um, being new to public transit uh, my background is in human services. I feel like I've never left human services because I think public transit is it's a human service industry uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Um, that, uh, oh, and I kind of got lost in the direction that I was going. Uh, oh, is one of the things that sur has surprised me is um, that the cascading effects that happen in public transit. And so one of the things that uh, going to zero fare has uh, impacted us negatively is that Medicaid uh, will pay folks, or will pay providers for transporting uh, people through the non-emergency medical transport service. Uh, but if there's fare free service, that, that they don't. And so when we went to fare free service, it ended up having there be a cost hit uh, to the organizations that uh, uh, that provide that transportation and so and so it's sometimes uh, there's there's more than just the the fare that uh, that people uh, you know pay um, that impacts uh, the cost throughout the system mm -hmm. yeah for sure it's, it's absolutely I mean public transit is absolutely a public service and it, it needs to be a well-funded public service I, I and, think it does the you know, point that I would hammer is that everyone benefits from having awesome, reliable public service, whether they're physically on that service yes. or not. If the person's in their signal occupancy vehicle yes. behind a bus that has 20 people on it, mm -hmm. that person should be very, very thankful mm -hmm. that there's 20 people on a bus in front of them and not 20 other single occupancy vehicles. And so the people in the single occupancy vehicle should be the biggest fan, the biggest supporter here mm -hmm. as well, of making this an awesome service that can attract more riders and that's I'm sure they're not thinking of that when they're in their little bubble mm -hmm. but I think that's a point that's important to to emphasize here as well absolutely well one of the things that uh, the GMT needs to figure out and uh, Chapin alluded to this is that uh, GMT like a lot of municipalities um, you know is it has a, a financial cliff you know that we're looking at uh, COVID funds are going to run out we're going to need to find additional sources of revenue. We look at the state and they're like, hey, our COVID funds are running out too. We're not going to be able to provide you anymore for public transit. So how are we going to, you know, bridge that gap? And I think that the way that you bridge that gap is that you make the connection that this is, you know, a human service. Um, I was very happy to hear, um, I used to work for Dale, the Department of Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living. Um, and they came and spoke at the Public Transit Advisory Council uh, last week because 
they're making a uh, uh, transportation a bigger emphasis of the state aging uh, plan and so the state has a 10-year aging plan and they realize that you know older folks uh, you know transportation is a huge challenge for them and uh, um, and with public transit these days being not just fixed route uh, but micro transit in some places and we have elderly and disabled or they just changed that to older and disabled to uh, and um, uh, you know so that my, my hope and the reason why I bring this up is is that as a former Dale employee I know that they distribute about half a billion dollars a year to service providers in the state to provide services you know if we could just get a little bit of that to provide these essential transportation services then I think the GMT you know would really be able to blossom and grow um, you know, because of that because the thing that's nice is is that even though we need a couple million dollars a year that's actually not a lot of money you know it, it is uh, uh, and I think if we can get people out of the mindset of just you know uh, uh, you know old buses you know going through town and that's what they're funding um, I think that I think that we'll be successful there mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, just a couple of Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Just a couple of comments on the, the fair itself. Um, is there any sense making having a lower cap for uh, just local routes? I, mean, I know it's in the per, per rider cost here, there's obviously winners and losers, and I appreciate your point about the simplicity of it, but maybe in the administration that sounds simpler now, mm -hmm. if I just stay in my zone, can I get capped out at 20 versus the person's making out real well if they're going back and forth on the link every day for the same price as I am going yep. two stops downtown? You know, I'm not sure that uh, the Gen Fair system allows route-specific um, caps like that, but I'd be happy to look into it. And I, I will say that um, at least a start, this is going to be complex enough mm -hmm. uh, but that would be something I would definitely want to look into in the future because one of the things that you know Chapin and I are going to be working on um, is that you know Burlington has traditionally um, provided support so that certain routes could be uh, fare free even when we operated fares and uh, uh, and perhaps that would be a sort of a different approach um, uh, with the with the new system so I, I like that idea. Yeah. I'm gonna, okay. I'll put this in my brain because if I don't put it in my notes here, I will forget about it. Great. Um, how does it work for like UVM students or, or staff? Do they do their do they need a new card or like do their student IDs magically get plugged in here? So what happens is is that we have what's called our unlimited access program. Uh, and uh, what they do is, is that they show their ID, uh, they're able to ride for free, and then we just hit a little button on the, on the fare box that counts them. And so they pay, um, uh, they pay a flat rate that we negotiate with them uh, each year. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the uh, attractions to that for them is that if you um, did it based on uh, specific um, rides, then those costs, you know, can go up pretty dramatically uh, uh, from year to year. And uh, from a budgetary perspective, it's easier for them to know that, hey, it was four hundred thousand dollars this year. It'll probably be about four to five percent more, you know, next year. Um, and so, uh, and so they pay out at that flat rate. Okay. And that's and that is also critical uh, for us to achieve our uh, achieve our fair goals. Yeah. That's great. So that, that button still works. Oh, yeah. Say. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, what if I'm like dealer.com or the, any company in town or the city of Burlington or something yeah. like that, and I want my people to, I, I want to like help, help subsidize their trips or something. How does I'm that so work? I'm so glad you asked this because I skipped over it for, the, for, the, uh, for time's sake. Um, the Gen Fair Link system allows us to create a portal for other organizations uh, so that we would be able to uh, uh, essentially they tell us who their employees are we then um, select those accounts would be visible on the dealer.com portal 
and then dealer.com would be able to add money to those accounts directly if they so chose. Um, or we could send them an invoice, you know, if they would prefer to do that. But this will actually um, and really improve the options uh, for organizations to be able to support uh, employees or people they're providing services for or um, students. Yeah. Uh, cool. yeah. So that, that would be nice because one of the concerns that we've had in the past is, is that, again, we would have this physical pass that, w that we would give to them. They would give to their employees. They then get distributed to the employees' friends, you know, mm -hmm. um, and so um, plus also um, with the system, if somebody leaves, you know, they can just go in and, you know, remove them from, you know, their payment structure. So, sure. so, so, so they'll be much more in control over who they're supporting. Oh, great. I like it. Yeah. So if I'm like chugging along, I'm paying with my, my smartphone, then I get a job with the city, mm -hmm. I go to HR, have them tell you, I now work for them. Exactly. You can like cover my thing. Sweet. And those details we're still figuring out because there's obviously some privacy components there. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I'm sure that we'll be able to uh, get that to work um, uh, pretty well. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, I think that's that's all for now. I'll take enough time. But I, I appreciate it. Oh, sorry. I got your, uh, your name wrong before. It's Mr. Clark. Oh, Clark. I didn't even notice. So. I think I said Mr. Clayton previously. Compared Mr. To Clark, usually, it's a pressure. It's a pleasure. <laughs> what, I, what I'm usually called, uh, compared to what I'm usually called, I, I accept that. It's, it's a good thing. <laughs> so. One of the things that I've loved about the new job is that I had no idea how opinionated people were about public transit Ooh. until I came into this job. I was like, wow. You should try parking. Should talk about parking. Try parking, <laughs> yeah. Talk about parking, we'll see. We talk about parking a lot here. I can't imagine. <laughs> People don't have a strong emotional feelings about parking, do they? <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks again for your presentation. I have a couple of questions here. Mm -hmm. um, for the smart card, um, is there, will there be a kiosk um, or does it have to be like a human transaction? To start, it will be a human transaction. Okay. Yeah. Eventually, hopefully moving towards a kiosk. We're going we're gonna to see what the demand is. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, family fair. So I thought about this as well. When my kids were little, mm -hmm. um, we lived too close to um, Burlington schools for them to get a bus pass, mm -hmm. but far enough for kids to lose their cool um, sometimes coming home. Yeah. And then it was like, 60 cents times three kids who has the freaking coins and then getting yes. on the bus and so forth. I would just love it um, mm -hmm. if there could be a consideration, some research into okay. like what a family card could look like. Okay. Um, you know, I only have three kids. Mm -hmm. um, I know some of um, my new American friends have m more than three kids. Mm -hmm. And these are folks who are truly transit dependent. Yes. Um, but who may, may not necessarily qualify for some assistance um, or get some assistance, but not others. Um, so just thinking about that kind of family piece, because the burden does generally fall on mothers. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be great to kind of look into and see what possibilities there are for a family car. Absolutely. Um, and then clarification on the ages, I appreciate that. Um, and then back back to um, kind of rural versus urban. I I don't want this to sound like a zero sum game mm -hmm. um, because it shouldn't be right. We're trying to like the vehicle ownership costs in rural areas is much higher than it is in urban areas. Mm -hmm. Their energy burdens are often greater, et cetera. Yep. Um, but when we think about what um, Chittenden County, what Burlington in particular, what Burlington taxpayers are investing in this service. Um, any investments in GMT, w where will they be targeted? Mm -hmm. What are the criteria um, kind of looking forward four years, mm -hmm. five years, whatever? Well, one of the things that um, I, um, is important to think about with GMT is that uh, I started off by talking about how we were kind of special because we have an urban and rural component. And in some ways, GMT really is two transit companies with a, with a shared management team mm -hmm. uh, because urban transit 
and rural transit are covered by different sections of federal statute and have different um, guidelines. And so we actually um, have to keep our monies separate from the two services. So all of the revenue that we get from, uh, from fares will stick within uh, the urban uh, system. Okay. And so what will happen is, is that um, uh, the unlimited access payments that we get, uh, that we talked about before, those can act as a direct federal match uh, for things like a, a new bus. Um, it's a little more complicated with, with fares because um, it's not just a, uh, uh, it's treated differently than local match, but we will then use that, uh, you know, to enhance the, the service uh, here within the urban zone. Um, and uh, so it's not going to be a, um, like we can't, uh, and, and in fact, I was actually talking about this in reverse um, in Barry City last night because they were like, why is, why is Chittenden County always the priority? And I'm like, just so you know, you know, we cannot take, you know, rural funds and give to Chittenden County and vice versa. Um, and so you had to stay, uh, stay here. Did okay. that answer your question? Yes, it, it did. Okay. I, and I think it's helpful, not only for Barry, but also for us. Yeah. Um, so I think I was on a call with, maybe it was a public forum call, when I was on my way to Tacoma mm -hmm. um, last month. And um, my kids are all GMT riders. Mm -hmm. um, oh, were you at the, one of the, pub, the public meetings yeah, during the airport? Yeah, I was in the airport. Yes. yes. That was me, yes. Okay. Um, so my youngest is 14. Um, she's a freshman at BHS. Um, we landed at SeaTac Airport. Mm -hmm. We took um, the link, the light rail, mm -hmm. into town, um, traveled around, and then she was with a friend, and they, they travel fare free. Um, then I went to Tacoma for a conference, mm -hmm. and my youngest said, I think it's going to be better for us if we can take the bus to the airport instead of taking a cab. Yeah. And we did. Mm -hmm. And it was like on the app, mm -hmm. sound transit, you get your Tacoma to Seattle ticket mm -hmm. online. I could download the, the app. Mm -hmm. They also have the transit app and you can get, um, depending on what system you are, what county, yep. um, you can get your ticket on, on the transit app. Mm -hmm. um, and she was kind of making fun of me because I was watching to see the bus arrive. She's like, it's coming. You don't need to keep watching. <laughs> That's her job to make fun of us. I know, mm -hmm. I know. But um, a lot of these kids, um, and she just got a phone, so um, we'll talk about the high school and middle school in a second. Yeah. Um, I think this, the ability to have these mul multiple platforms are going to make it easy and accessible um, mm -hmm. to folks that is, it's, it's integrated, we can see where it is, um, and it's all good. And one of the things that um, uh, the GenFair app um, will offer some of the similar uh, information as the Transit app. And so what that will do is it will give uh, our, we're going to keep the Transit app as well. And so our riders will be able to kind of figure out, you know, actually I like this app better or I like, uh, you know, the one app over the other. And so uh, we're, we're happy that, uh, um, that, because, you know, I don't want to speak bad of the transit app, but I don't always love it uh, when I use it for my own, you know, transportation around. And so I'm really curious to see how GenFair's version of it um, is it's going to be using the same data, mm -hmm. but you know, of course, how that data is packaged is you know can be super. Make important. sure the bus drivers put their whatever notification they need on. <laughs> yes. Um, so my little segue into um, into schools. So um, a lot of our middle schoolers and our high schoolers mm -hmm. use the bus. Mm -hmm. Um, there are also a lot of elementary skid, school kids who, who use the bus, but let's talk about the, the folks who move around a lot more independently. Mm -hmm. um, and I spoke about this in that forum, like the outreach to the schools mm -hmm. and the users. You talked about doing outreach um, to the community. Mm -hmm. I want to underscore that um, these transit riders are also your community mm -hmm. dealing with 
teenagers is its own challenge. I get it. Yes. Um, but I think it's also a really port important, really important audience mm -hmm. um, to use. Some of some of these folks will still be transit dependent. I mean, my son right now does not have access to a vehicle. I mean, he could have access to our vehicle, but we don't let him. Mm -hmm. um, but but this idea that here we have um, mm -hmm. real users of this system mm -hmm. and making sure that this change that's going to happen partway through the school year mm -hmm. is communicated to after school, to King Street, to mm -hmm. um, Sarah Holbrook, to Boys and Girls Club, to the YMCA, mm -hmm. to all the schools and all those partners, mm -hmm. as well as these kids. I think that outreach is, is pretty important. Mm -hmm. And uh, Chris, I'm going to call upon you again. Burlington High School is still going to be getting the free rides, right? The school district pays yeah. through the city's assessment. Right. So so those folks, will similar to like the CATMA folks. They'll still be able to use their ID? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But then, mm. so this is what happened when my oldest, this mm. was, she graduated in, the, in 2020. Yeah. She could, there was like a time limit on when they could use the bus. And yes. so if you're at a sports practice out on Institute Road, yes. and it finishes at whatever Maybe time, yeah, yeah yes. right. Then all of a sudden, like, eh, 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 you can't, so. I, I, I know that in the, in the past that the school district has wanted us to have that limit because of their concerns about liability. I don't, th I think that we're going to be moving away from that because it doesn't make sense for some of the reasons that you are describing. And uh, um, so I think that this is one of the areas that we're still working out, but I, I'm not interested in, um, I want the, the job for the driver to be as simple as possible because okay. I want them focused on driving. Mm -hmm. And uh, to have to figure out whether to charge after seven or before, you know, those are things that I'm not really interested in. And so uh, I think that we're going to be moving in that direction. Okay. And then w one final question on, like, the institutions. And so if you have BSD, so Bur Burlington School District, um, Champlain, uh, UVM, I don't know who else has um, cards, and you, there's, like, the button that the driver pushes. How do you differentiate between institutions on who's getting on the bus? I bl it's because they show their ID. They show their ID, and there's, like, a different button to push? Yes. Okay. Yeah. That was great. See, this we're an easy crowd. <laughs> well, just because you ask questions, I just luckily happen to know. <laughs> so, and although I did, Chris, I did it, have to rely on There's a little Chris. matrix that shows which school. Yeah. yeah. Charging. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. I think that's it. Yay! Yay! Um, any um, anyone on the anyone on the hotline there who has public comment? There is no one left on the line, so no public comment right now. Okay, and no one in the room. Um, and there's no action on this, so um, thank, right. thank you very much for your time. Thank Excellent. you. Yes, and I'll we'll go play Zelda. Yes. And, and Chapin, Chape, I hope you feel better. <laughs> uh, me too. I do feel better. I'm just trying to, you know, keep everybody else better. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Thanks. Thanks so much. Take care. All right. We will um, close item number six um, on to the next, the DPW Commission Annual Report to City Council. Oh, yeah. Great. Uh, Chair O'Neill Vivanco, uh, do you want to kick this off? Do you want me to? Why, why, don't, you, why don't you start? Because I realized I didn't pull that um, up. Or actually, I, I guess I could, maybe I'll start and you jump in. Oh, do you have it up? Okay. Uh, yes, Rob uh, was ready because Rob's amazing. Because he is. <laughs> um, the city council previous to COVID had every year the expectation that uh, the commissions would provide a written annual report to the to the city council as the city council uh, allows commissions or directs commissions to take care of work uh, that in the charter is assigned to the city council. And so uh, the council appreciates these annual reports. We stopped it during COVID uh, and now President Paul, the city council wants to restart them. And uh, uh, they want to start with the end of FY23. We have now ended FY23. 
Um, thanks to uh, Rob and uh, Chair O'Neill Vivanco and Vice Chair Damiani. Uh, we were able to put together this summary for folks. And, uh, you know, I'll let Peggy uh, lead the, the next phase here. But ultimately, what the um, Clerk Treasurer's Office would like is us to vote on a uh, on a memo that we that the commission all supports and then have the commissioners all sign it at the bottom uh, to a test of their support and then that gets submitted into the um, city clerk and will be put on an agenda at a future future council meeting thanks so this was sent to us um was it monday um, as, a, as a draft letter, which is um, up there on the screen. Uh, it's, uh, it's really just um, a kind of brief overview of, um, I'm gonna borrow one of um, Director Spencer's favorite um, sayings, hitting the wave tops, um, <laughs> on um, the, the items and issues over the past year that um, the staff has brought forward to the commission and um, we, have, we have voted on and supported. Um, so just kind of list by, list by topic, um, everything from Great Streets to North Winooski Avenue um, to the Rail Yard Enterprise. Um, so not, not incredible um, detail, again, just a broad overview. Um, and then, um, one one big thing that um, Commissioner Damiani and I um, felt important to include was youth engagement. Um, the City Council um, rec recommended, oh, made a resolution, thank you, of expanding youth representation on city boards. Um, before the pandemic, I think we had um, a couple of students show up a couple of times, um, but Certainly, as a as a parent, um, I feel like it really privileges the privileged. Um, it's a student has to get here um, and not have any other work commitments or any other time commitments or homework, and then be able to get home. And even um, even with the advantages of Zoom, um, they're not always accessible to all students. Um, what we have started to do is we've built a relationship with the Burlington City and Lake program. I'm like not talking to you either, sorry. Um, which is um, part of, it's a semester long program run each semester through the Burlington High School. And um, these 20 students are really uh, a microcosm of, um, of BHS. And we've had these um, consultancies with um, a, you know, a small number of commissioners, and we can kind of move, move through the commission, um, keeping the numbers, um, so that we don't um, don't reach a quorum. And they work with uh, city staff and present their own findings. One was on Main Street, Great Streets um, presentation with um, the design the design team and the engineering staff. Um, and GMT, and another one was um, a mobility audit in the Old North End, and um, DPW staff was there as well to receive some of this information. And it's, a, I think, an innovative way to um, get youth participation in a much deeper way. Um, it's not in a meeting format, but it's still rich engagement. So um, this is just what, what has been, what we did a couple of times this past year. So, those are my wave tops of Chapin's wave tops. Well said. Um, any any discussion about this um, this this memo or the youth engagement? Commissioner Fox, do you want to start? Yeah. Um, I guess I don't know if this is more of like a personal sort of like taste option but the memo reads like all of a sudden you know so it's very cut and dry this is the commission this is what it does and then it's all of a sudden youth engagement like it felt a little bit abrupt to me so I don't know like if there's a way to sort of nicely segue that or maybe 
something I wrote in here, like, is it worth adding one or two sentences at the end of the overview of the commission section um, that explains, like, the purpose of the document, maybe, or, like, just something to make it a little more cohesive mm -hmm. when you're reading it. Um, I'm not sure if that's too nitpicky, but, yeah, the question yeah. I put there is, like, what's the goal or the objective? And I think it's great to include the youth engagement in there, but, um, yeah, like, so what, I guess, is the question you always ask yourself, right, when you're reading something. Okay. So, um, and you get you address that with the youth engagement, but, yeah, just the sort of, like, cohesiveness of it is something that caught me off guard, I think, a tiny bit. Okay. Um, um, and then beyond that, I think it w I just had a clarification question. I think that was mostly answered, but this is specifically on the work that we as the commission have has done. It is not reflective of how the our actions have you know led to outcomes on specific infrastructure projects. I'm just thinking, right? Like there are now bike lanes on North Winooski Avenue. Right? Is it worth saying that that it was like the final outcome? But I don't know if that's beyond the scope or and goal of this document. Um, it sounds like that's like sort of outside of it, right? What do you think, Chapin? Yeah, uh, my understanding is that the uh, that the council is looking for what the commission did and what the work was at the commission level. Is okay. you all are the appointees of the council? So that is my understanding, uh, but I could get confirmation. We can uh, act on this tonight, or we can uh, you know, create some suggestions for revisions and bring it back next month as well. Uh, so either option is fine. Okay. okay. Yeah, those were the only two big things I had. All right. Um, Commissioner Hogan. Thanks for putting that draft together. I think it, you know, it reads fine. Uh, it's accurate. It does need to be in there per Director Spencer's comment that you know this document is looking for a summary of um, commission ac activities. But I think it's important to emphasize to Council the importance of traffic calming to go hand in hand with a reduced emphasis on law enforcement um, calming of our streets and that you know it needs to go hand in hand with continued support for uh, sort of self-correcting on our on our streets um, that's sort of my <clears throat> recurring point that I, I think we should emphasize to council when we get the chance to it doesn't need to be now but certainly in to our to our two colleagues to council this spring approaching approaching budget season everything that's sort of a, a corollary and certainly much of our commission work does have to do with you know sliding around the, the right of way a bit to calm things and make things um safer so anyway so all this to say i, I have no edits to this i think it's great but in generally in communicating with council you know, if you get the chance to like uh, add a voice track to it, <laughs> it when you're up there, okay. uh, you know, sort of hammer on the, the, the point of our uh, improvements in their street safety. Thank you. Okay. Um, Commissioner Sears. So I, I don't think I see your version, Peggy. I see like a shorter, it's two pages, doesn't mention engagement. Um, it was sent on Monday. It was sent separately. From sent the separately. Oh, I don't another, think I have. I think it was another attachment that I might have shared. Oh, did you send, I'm sorry, Jim. Um, I ended up getting something from DPW, so I, I didn't actually open up. Um, Mine. Yeah. <laughs> so I think you sent it to my work email. Okay. Yeah. I'll look at it. Justine, you want me to um, 
you want to just read quietly uh-huh. and I'll go on to Jim and then you can yes. jump in? Okay. I will, I will read quietly. Okay. <laughs> Commissioner quietly. Barr. Yes. <laughs> Almost last. Um, Brandon kind of, or Commissioner Hogan kind of stole some of mine. I, I think safety definitely needs to be uh, one of the emphasized things that we as a commission appointed by the council take a, a very high priority on. Um, but again, I, I love the doc, document. I think it's great as is. I, I only question two, and, and I know this is from today past what we've done, but Commissioner Sears is now a commissioner, and I wonder if she should just be included in this, or is this a calendar year or a fiscal year document? Um, yeah, I, I think the way I envision it is that um, it would be sent by the current commission, uh, but listing who served in FY23. The document is meant to be a record of what occurred in mm -hmm. the fiscal year. And yeah, so fiscal, so FY23 ended in July. July. June. Or 30th. June. Yeah. And we didn't meet in July. Okay. Okay, that's right. it. That's good for me. Back um, to. Well, Chris, do you want to, I mean, do you want to? I think the only thing I was going to add is that uh, my understanding, and you can correct me, Chapin, that city council um, would potentially ask some of the, the various city commissions to come speak at council. So I think that's our opportunity to address some of these other mm -hmm. uh, comments. Um, and I think we'll have about a month. You said maybe in October is when they would um, ask commissions to, to speak. Yes, if we approved it tonight, I think it's based on when we submit it to the city clerk. So if we approved it tonight, I think we'd be in October. If we didn't, then we'd be likely going in November to the council. And it's ultimately President Paul's call, but uh, given the visibility and the, uh, the impact that our commission has, uh, very frequently we're asked to present in front of the council. Okay. I think, I think in the year in review, perhaps we can just have a line about, um, you know, improvements in si um, s street safety and traffic calming um, that take a high priority in our work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just a statement about that. Mm -hmm. um, safety in all mobility modes. Safety yeah. in all mobility modes. And I think if we, just, honestly, if we move the youth engagement piece into the year in review, that might just help I think piece so. it together in the yeah. timeline as well. Okay. Yeah. That's a great one. Mm -hmm for simplicity's yeah. sake and hopefully, you know, I think also to, to the commission's point of if we can get this in front of city council after, if it's adopted tonight, um, mm -hmm. getting to them in October, I think would be more valuable than potentially November, December as they're and in budget happens. season. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Commissioner Sears. I, oh, I saw, oh, I see it. Um, Director Spencer, could you share your screen um, so that Justine could at least glance at? Or actually, you know what? Let me let me see if I can send it, resend it. Yeah, Rob is sharing it. <clears throat> okay. And I'm trying to type up some edits that can be responsive while you all uh, continue. Justine, I just resent it. I don't know if you are on your public uh, works email. I no. I I um no. I haven't um accessed that yet. So for youth engagement, um Do we want to put that right after the year in review? Um, or do we want to incorporate it within kind of each, like the two months that it was? In like the fall time period? Yeah. Like one was October and one was, the next one was like February. I, I guess I feel like, an, I feel like it's important to have like this statement about youth engagement because it's um, a different take than just having, just kind of clicking a box and having youth on board. Okay. 
Eliana, did you have thoughts? Well, I think it makes sense to have it in the year in review section. And is it possible to just have, I mean, you have the, the two dates of the two different events in there. Mm -hmm. I think that's fine. So just list, just yeah. list youth engagement uh, um, as like the, the first part of the, the year. first part of the year in review. Yeah. Okay. And there could be a, a short transition ahead of the commission provided guidance on blah blah blah. There could be like in addition to youth engagement, blah 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Are you getting this, Justine? Do you need, do you need Rob to scroll? Oh, um, sorry. I was trying to open my uh, the, the email account. Um, yes, I read this. Thank you. And I, I did send it again, okay. this time to the Burlington one. OK, that's the, um, I haven't accessed that account yet. I, I can either read this, or else I could try to access that account. So I think I'll just oh, okay. try to read this here. So Chapin and Rob, I mean, at least just for right now, um, we have um, the mission statement, the commissioners, um, and then overview of the commission, more information, the year in review, um, and in the year in the review, adding a sentence about um, uh, timely public works matters, considered regulatory changes, to the issue of that, um, and considered regulatory changes to advanced municipal projects. <coughs> um, maybe then including a sentence about um, um, our work includes or adds improvements in street safety and traffic calming, or that improvements in streets safety and traffic calming take a high priority in our work, something like that. Next, in addition, the DPW Commission has discussed how we can meaningfully engage the younger generation, so that youth section goes right in the year review before going into um, each of the major subheadings. Does that, does that the, those two edits make sense?
Yes, that makes sense. I'm uh, okay. trying to make those changes right now. Okay. Any comments, Justine? Or are you? Um, no, I, I don't. I, I probably. Should, I don't even really feel like I should vote on this. I don't. So write it or approve or just I don't have a good sense of I mean it's a really impressive um, list of activities but I can't speak to how complete or it is or a characterization am I supposed to I, I do I have know. a role here <laughs> what, 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 yeah. I trust that I trust that you wrote a great letter I don't doubt that but oh I can't <laughs> speak to the content of it with any authority. So Chapin, how does that work? Um, because Justine wasn't on the commission, but then would right. she sign off on it as part of the commission for this year or not? You know, I think it's fine if she wants to uh, <clears throat> to abstain and the other members sign on who were actually members of the commission back in FY23, I think that's fine. Okay. All right. Um, I can, uh, let me see if I can share my screen. I've just jumped over to another computer. We'll see if it's crap. It crashes, but I've made the edits that I think might be responsive. So let me see okay. if I can pull this off. should be able to if you're having there you go and can folks see what I have displayed yep mm -hmm. uh, to do a little one sec great are people able, able to see this Yep. 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 Great. So what I did here is I moved the youth engagement down to underneath year in review. Mm -hmm. And in the year in review, I added the DPW commission is focused on ways we can support increased traffic safety for all mobility modes with less traffic enforcement capacity in our community. Robust traffic calming and roadway safety improvements will be critical to making our roads even safer. Then uh, I put youth engagement as the first bullet under year in review. And I haven't changed any language yet about it and the transition to it, but I think I'm getting closer. I, I think that's, um, that's good. I think that's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, so we need to, um, we need to vote on we need to approve this draft letter um, to present to city council. Um, Can I make a motion to accept this edited draft letter? Um, but I will with the proviso. How are we going? Are we going to physically sign it? Can, can we do it to? Can we e-sign or do it to physically sign? Um, I think the easiest is since you all are there. Um, what I'm going to do is email it over to Rob and uh, Holly and. I, that we can have a print before you leave the door. Okay. So that's a motion to approve this version <laughs> that Director Spencer just shared with us. Okay. I'll second that. Um, why, why can't I remember this? Um, okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Nope. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, and then Justine, you are going to abstain? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Convincing, That's unconvincingly fine. abstain? I mean, I mean, if you, you don't need, you don't need a, you're not, we need sure, you. are you? We need you, but 
Yeah. We need you, but we don't need you for this one. Five of you guys, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, okay. So we had um, an I for myself. So five approval and one abstention. Okay, and we will sign this on our way out the door this evening. Okay. Um, Makes it easier so that Commissioner Sears doesn't have to yeah, then come all the way down. <laughs> I have to the <laughs> Good thing you abstained. <laughs> Okay, um, great, we'll close that out and now go on to the director's report as he edits and directs. All right, so thank you. Um, why don't we go to commissioner uh, updates just so I can pull up my director's report uh, as I just got it off to the document to uh, Robin Holly, so. Commissioner communications? Yeah. Okay. Um, Commissioner Hogan, you want to start? Thank you. I'd love to. Uh, the lines, stripes look good. Got to see some uh, the striping work getting done. Um, that said, I, I, I really kind of un unrelated. Heard uh, some concerns amongst neighbors about uh, driver speeds on Locust Street. I know it was. Um, Re-upped with some bump outs a couple years ago, but uh, the drivers are still hauling down the hill there. I pulled up the, I think it's a VTrans dashboard with like the traffic counts and things, just like looking for recent speed data here. And I'll try to connect with you offline about that. Cause I, I swear I remember seeing tubes over there, you know, in, in the last year or two, but the VTrans website doesn't have anything past 2020 on Locust Street but um, we can c connect up that and maybe um, I anyway, just sort of putting it out there look it's been calm but maybe not calm sufficiently and we are um, do you I can give you a quick response if you want please uh, we are doing traffic uh, speed study there the tubes have been put out uh, we are uh, reviewing the data and cleaning the data and we'll have that for the residents who have asked for it and happy to share it with you uh, Commissioner Hogan and uh, then we can determine whether any additional interventions are necessary or whether or not you know people are uh, complying with the 25 mile an hour speed or if not then we can look at additional interventions you know we are learning uh, on sloped hills and you know how our design uh, speed humps work uh, and also uh, work with emergency services. Uh, we've continually worked with the Burlington Fire Department on these types of interventions. And I think as people have seen what we've added recently on Birchcliffe Parkway as part of the paving project is kind of where we've gotten uh, comfortable to get to a five inch or so raised crosswalk or speed hump. And that uh, neighbor response there has been uh, quite positive about the design of, of those uh, speed humps there. So uh, I, I think you know we're in a learning process and constantly evolving and the fire department's getting more comfortable with these types of uh, tools as they understand the tapers allow the trucks to, to clear the, the, the speed humps. So um, we're gonna take a look at the data and see whether any additional interventions need. Thanks. So can you clarify, this was, uh, did you all do your own counts then? This was not part of the state or the our planning commission's program? Um, I believe, I'm not sure, I don't know exactly. I think we were doing it in coordination with the CCRPC, um, yeah, but I would need to double check. All I know is that tubes were down this year. Uh, I know residents had asked for it. We wanted to see the post construction uh, data results once the uh, installation had been in long enough that traffic had kind of found its normal cadence uh, with that design. Okay, thanks for the sanity check that uh, <laughs> <laughs> confirms I had seen tubes out there more recent than 2020. Uh, yeah. All right, nothing further here, thank you. Um, Commissioner Barr. Oh, thank you. 
<laughs> so my, the comments I have are, are all positive, I like to think as usual. Um, today, uh, several members of my, of the Old East End got a chance to meet with uh, some of your staff, Julia and uh, Maddie, and then a couple of other folks, um, and, and very positive engagement, uh, very uh, good to have that kind of engagement where we've got some neighborhood, I won't call them activists, um, that might sound too harsh, uh, interested people who are, are coming here to find out what's the right thing to do for traffic calming and safety to improve our neighborhood. And I just wanted to say it was, you know, kudos to your staff, Director Spencer. We're really, really happy with that. So. Great. Well, thanks, Jim. We uh, are fortunate to have a great team. We are short staffed with a couple of <coughs> resignations in the planning team. So the fact the engineers uh, are stepping up uh, even more is just a testament to them. Thank you. I'll pass it on. That's it. Um, Commissioner Sears. Yes, I just wanted to comment on the, I think in the consent agenda, there was a parking change on Walnut Street that was brought to the project DPW's attention by IAA. Um, I just want that issue is much, much larger than those parking spaces. Um, and I know someone was planning to come to public comment tonight. She didn't, um, but she's been talking to residents about turning Walnut one way um to and just to help with flow and drop off at the school there's renovations that are planned um and there's a a number it's of things that i think need to happen around iaa um and i just wanted to it's much much larger than and i think that um there's some pretty basic changes that could be made to Archibald in terms of infrastructure, in terms of crossing guards that could relieve some of the congestion. And yes, the parking spaces, that's fine. And they're needed because mm -hmm. during the renovations, the school will be losing 10 spaces, et cetera, et cetera. But the, I mean, I think they're much, much larger underlying problems that really need to be dealt with. So I just um, wanted to keep that issue open. And I think it's, it's gonna come back before you so. Great. Uh, yes, understood that this is one small action. Uh, I know uh, Engineer Peterson had been in touch with the schools and with the community, and, and we don't consider one isolated action as the entirety of the actions that need to be discussed and pursued. Yes, and it's much appreciated. I think they'll be so excited to have those parking spaces back, but um, there's a much larger congestion issue, I think, that needs to be dealt with and can be dealt with, I think if, so about 30, it's a magnet school, it wasn't, clearly the parking lot wasn't designed to be a magnet school, but um, I think the vast majority of children do come from the neighborhood. So they can be walking, they can be biking, and they simply don't feel safe doing so right now. And I think that could be addressed pretty, not easily, but I don't think it's a too heavy a lift. Great. So. Um, Commissioner Fox. Um, I think I'll echo what Commissioner Shear said about sort of IAA. Um, I will say this reminded me of like, I think in the spring I had a friend of mine who is the crossing guard there sort of reach out to me about it and say, you know, the teachers are concerned about parking. So I think my general comment is just that I'm glad to hear that the department is in touch with you know, administrators and teachers from the school and is gonna continue to work with them. Um, so just to sort of echo that continued work and relationship building, that's good, that's important. Um, another thing, um, totally separate from this, but I was excited to see, um, and I think someone, you know, a neighbor mentioned this on Front Porch Forum as well, but the new curb ramps on North Street, um, they're awesome. I think that was a huge improvement, you know, for ADA, that sidewalk was, messed up um so that was great to see and great to see that dpw got sort of a little bit of recognition from the community on that um 
The other cool thing I noticed on North Street were the, I don't know what you call them, but the thing, the bike signal triggers in the ground. So they're now at every intersection up and down North Street or almost every intersection, you know, where you sit on them and they change the light. They were only at North Street and North Ave for a while. And now, did anyone else notice that? North Street and North Ave. But now they're, no, they're they're like the things that you stop on and it changes the light. Yeah, and uh they're like, if you're heading down North Street, it Uh just makes, you know, so the lights turn when you get there or when you stop on it. Anyway, I noticed. I like them. Let's do more of that. (laughs) Awesome. Yeah. Um, So I think that's like a minor, you know, sort of, I don't know how minor it is actually from the installation perspective, but I thought it was a good improvement. Um, And then, yeah, I won't harp on the the staffing and stuff, but I think it would be great to hear sort of at the next meeting what your, if there are any updates on that, because I don't know, I, I'm pretty, pretty bummed um, in terms of the, the planners. So yeah, I think that's all, but just an update on staffing generally would be good, I think, to hear from you all. Okay, that's it. Okay, Vice Chair Gemini. Uh, a couple things I think, uh, Great to see, what is it, North North Union and Grant Street with the, the bump outs out there. Um, really good to see yeah. that the other day. Um, I also, I brought this up, I think, a few meetings ago, uh, but over at Edmonds, um, just the having a sign further south uh, as folks on the road are approaching the South Union and Main Street entrance of having the straight and left turn lane sign with the right turn lane sign um, having another one just further south so cars uh, have a know where they what lane they need, need to be in a lot sooner um, I was biking on it recently and um, had a near miss yeah. over there uh, that that is one that's on my list as well and I'll make sure it gets done before uh, winter because that is a confusing intersection for people if they're not uh, seeing the markings clearly excellent thank you um, and then finally, uh, <laughs> it's, it's TDM week, and I was thinking about uh, seven months from now, on April 8th, 2024, is uh, the total solar eclipse. Oh, that, is a, that we are right in the path of totality. So I was curious to know what uh, the city is doing uh, in terms of planning for potentially mass amounts of people coming to the Burlington area for this uh, big event. It's on the back burner. <laughs> yeah, I know it's on the back burner, but... There's a lot of people potentially coming, so I'm just curious if there's been any it's, conversation. Uh, it's got our attention, and uh, it's actually being organized uh, by others in the city other than DPW. They're coordinating with us and talking about how the Main Street project will interact with uh, that. It's April uh, 8th or something, 2024. Uh, I'm not going to snub my family who's decided to go to Texas because they think it's less cloudy in Texas and that they're more likely to see it than they will in Burlington. I'm offended, but I'll get over it. Uh, But yes, we are coordinated on that. And, uh, you know, it it is going to be a large event and I think an opportunity for us to do some remote park and rides, uh, given the intensity of uh, that day in particular. Excellent. Thank you. That's it. All right. Um, Yeah, as soon as you sort out South Union in front of Edmonds Middle, because I I don't have any more kids there anymore. Like, maybe there could just be, like, an icon of me in the street. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway. I like that. (laughs) Um, So uh, I'm going to talk about Uh, cross-department coordination, not just parking um, and um, overlake and being towed and construction. (laughs) I'll fill the rest of the commission on that later. Um, You know, but but that's one example. Another example, um, I had someone reach out to me because there's there's some tree branches that were obstructing a sign on Mansfield Avenue and they contacted DPW, DPW said, contact the city arborist. The city arborist said, well, we already did the trimming, contact DPW. So at the end of the day, <laughs> the, you know, there, there isn't clear communication 
about who does what and a tree trimmer sees like trees that need to be trimmed in a certain way but not necessarily how that um, interacts with infrastructure um, and it's harder to see that sign in, from farther away until you get close to it. It's uh, by Loomis and Mansfield. Um, so again, if there are ways, and I know it's not just public works, it's us working with other departments, um, but just finding ways for clearer communication on some of these pieces. And we'll, we'll talk more about parking yeah. and construction another time. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I would just uh, say uh, definitely when uh, sometimes BED parks ourselves, we have construction in the right of way. We're not often coordinating across departments, but in terms of the experience that your uh, uh, colleague or friend had, I, I think ultimately when somebody calls any city department, there should be a much smoother handoff such that the person leaves that thinking that uh, we tried to resolve it for them. Uh, people don't see departments, they see the city. So. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, there's clearly, it, we get thousands of calls and thousands of C-click fixes. These are hard to deal with. Uh, some of them are easy, but the, the volume of this is hard, and I'd like to probably better understand that specific situation to make sure we can resolve how these calls get handled. We have the, I think, uh, most effective customer service team in the city. Um, so with that said, we are often juggling many other departments' work and that can also bear down on us, but we need to find a way to resolve that internally as I think your point is and not show that to the public. The public needs to leave these calls feeling like the city has taken care of their concern or at least given them the information. So I think it's a it's good insight for us to take back. And I will say, you know, the comment was, everyone was very nice about it. Um, yeah. So kudos on that, um, but, but resolution would be great. <clears throat> Um, thank you. Um, the homeless encampment on South Union Street by the YMCA in that, um, that little nook by the stairs on South Union Street uh, at, that, at that entrance, it's, um, it's come, it's gone, it's come, it's gone. It's growing and it's growing. Um, there are clothes hanging over the railing, um, their tents. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of youth traffic that goes um, to and from Edmonds Middle, Edmonds L, and to the library, as well as to, um, to City Market. Um, it, that corner just doesn't feel safe anymore. So I don't know if that's a billboard category um, or how we lean on the, it's complicated I know, but or how we lean on the building owner. Um, Right. We are having a conversation internally about um, some uh, encampments that are within the public rights of way, and I can add this one to the list. Okay, thanks. Um, so the staffing across departments in preparation for, for snow season, uh, you know, this is separate from um, like the traffic engineers, but just wondering, I know, I know we're still like, you know, now the leaves have even turned yet, but just thinking about um, um, streets and water and making sure that, um, you know, the, the, the staff that we have there are all able to um, deal with snow removal when the time comes and what our um, gaps in our staffing are. Uh. I if will there, uh, give a quick update, and then Rob, if you want, um, the quick update is that uh, we are well staffed in street maintenance. Uh, we weren't a couple months ago, but uh, there's been a lot of shuffling within the city uh, that has fully uh, staffed up our street maintenance team, which is great. A number of folks that we're hiring don't come with CDLs, so that's the challenge. We're needing to do a lot more training uh, to get people uh, up and running for the plow trucks, you don't need a CDL to be in the sidewalk tractors. Um, and we do have uh, a very large number of vacancies in water distribution, which is the work crew who maintains the water distribution lines from the water plant to your homes and businesses. So we are uh, likely starting pretty significant hiring bonuses, uh, at least so that's our intent. We're working with the union to try to work that through. Uh, so that we can fill those positions uh, by the, before the dead of winter. 
Uh, so that's where our greatest burn is right now in our water distribution team. Okay, and um, do, do water distribution need to um, be able to drive plows during snow situations? <clears throat> Yes, the, C the collective bargaining agreement for AFSME has that uh, up to six water resources staffers need to help out with plowing operations. That can come from wastewater, it can come from the water plant, it can come from water distribution. So, uh, but having six people coming from water at a time where water is struggling with staffing, you know, is an area that, you know, we're recognizing is tight and that's why we're gonna hopefully bring forward some very generous uh, hiring bonuses and some referral bonuses uh, to try to fill those positions. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Um, and then I, I heard on Front Porch Forum that there's traffic calming going on uh, South Prospect Street. Uh, Karen Paul wrote in. Rumble That's strips. correct. Rumble the strips. very small uh, speed, uh, the old speed humps that are really tiny and small are being replaced by uh, speed humps that are compliant with our current uh, design standard. Okay, that sounds great. As long as they're uh, maintained, like the ones on Summit Street, two my, two my, two my main routes. Um, towards the end, towards Maple Street. It's chunked up where kind of I ride my bike heading um, north. I know it's not all about me, but uh, <laughs> um, but just making sure that there's there's adequate maintenance on the on you know any of those um, traffic calming so that when they get chunked up, um, there's still enough space for you know cyclists to kind of move around safely. Yeah, uh, the speed humps have less aggressive uh, rises, yes, okay. and so hopefully shouldn't be uh, destroyed by the plows the same way that the more abrupt humps in the past have been. Okay, great. That's it for me. Um, all right, we will close Commissioner Communications and then go back to the Director's Report. Great. I'll be very quick because it's late and uh, my daughter is going to bed tonight, so one way or another. Um, North Plant Siphon Repair, uh, I wanted to give an update to the Commission uh, that uh, we have been moving very boldly ahead. As you know, we went from the pump and haul approach to get wastewater off of the broken siphon back to North Plant. Then after 10 days, we were able to get the bypass uh, force main completed and now that is operating. Uh, we are moving uh, quickly on the next repair, which is repairing the actual uh, sewer main or siphon underneath the Winooski River uh, because we don't want to be trying to maintain and operate a uh, above ground wastewater line in the depths of winter. So uh, we do have that RFP out, and um, I think responses just came back uh, yesterday. I need to get briefed on them, but we are gunning for a construction this fall so that the repair under the Whiskey River, albeit a, still a temporary repair, uh, can be made and that siphon can be put back in service. We really see kind of a three-step process. One was the force main bypass. The second is repairing the siphon under the river. And the third is determining what the permanent fix uh, that will last decades will be. And we'll certainly keep folks informed. We've been talking to FEMA about this three-step process. They understand it. FEMA has indicated that they are gonna support and participate in each step of the way, which has been great. We'll let you know if that changes, but we're very confident to have FEMA support for that. And um, we'll keep you posted. And I think, you know, the Champlain Parkway, as everybody has seen right outside the, the door of where you're meeting, is uh, fully under construction. Uh, the shared use path, uh, first coat of asphalt, uh, is going to go down in the next day or two. And uh, the contractor is ahead of schedule. Uh, they're doing a great job. If there are specific issues we need to attend to, please let us know. Uh, we're working hard to minimize the impacts to adjacent property owners and travelers, but uh, 
The goal is to be substantially completed for this initial construction contract from Home Avenue to Kilburn by the end of this construction season. Happy to answer any questions. Wow, that's great. Any questions? No. Nope. <clears throat> All right. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for that report. Um, now we'll go to um, adjournment. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? <laughs> Seconded. Seconded by Commissioner Fox. Um, all in, um, any discussion around that? Don't forget to sign the document. Don't forget to sign the document. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Barr. All right. All in favor of adjourning? Say aye. 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 Any, um, any opposed? <laughs> no. All right, we will see you all October 18th, same bat time, same bat channel. <laughs>